In this video, we're going to be revising the trade and globalization topic of the National 5 Geography course. This is part of the Global Issues Unit, which you will find in Section 3 of the exam paper. Here, you will be given a choice of two questions from a list of six to answer. And trade and globalization is normally the fourth on that list of six. A few key points. As I've said, this is an optional topic, so please make sure that it is one of the topics that you have been taught in class. The question will normally be made of two parts. Part A will ask you to describe information from a map or graph relating to some aspect of trade or globalization, and it will normally be worth four marks. Part B will require you to explain either the causes, the effects of, or responses to inequalities in world trade patterns, and this will normally be worth six marks. I've grouped the learning outcomes around part A and part B of the question. So for part A, you will need to be able to make sure that you can describe patterns of change using a graph showing information about trade and globalization, and you will need to be able to make sure that you can do the same thing, describing patterns, but this time from a map that shows information about trade and globalization. For part B, you will need to make sure that you can explain the causes of inequalities in world trade patterns, the impact that these inequalities can have on people and on the environment, and strategies to reduce these inequalities. Let's have a look at some Part A questions. As I said, sometimes you'll be presented with a question about a graph. In this case, the question says, describe in detail the changes in the number of fair trade employees from 2013 to 2014. In order to pick up marks for a question of this type, you will need to give the year, the number, in this case, of fair trade employees, from that year, and then a second year, and the number of employees from that year, and then also give the difference in between those two figures and say whether it has increased or decreased. To give you an example, for seed cotton, the number of employees in 2013 was about 60,000, but in 2014, this had decreased to just over 50,000, which was a fall of about 10,000. If you find two figures that are roughly the same, as is the case with employees in bananas, it's probably best not to mention them, because the question does ask you to describe the changes, not areas where there weren't any changes. There has not, up to this point, for trade and globalization, been a question that asks you to describe patterns from a map. However, there is no reason why this can't happen in the future. So I put this together as an example. The question that I've written is describe in detail the global pattern of total wealth in trillions of US dollars. To pick up marks for a question like this, you'll simply need to name countries or specific regions of continents and give figures from the key in the corner of the map. Like, for example, most of Western Europe has a wealth of between 10 and 50 trillion US dollars, whereas the USA has a wealth of over 50 trillion US dollars. Part B, you could be presented with a question that asks you to explain the causes of inequalities in trade, as was the case in 2017. You could be asked to describe the impacts of inequalities in world trade on people and the environment, as was the case in 2015. 
Or you could be asked to explain some of the strategies to reduce the inequalities in world trade, whether that's to explain the advantages and disadvantages of belonging to trade alliances, as was the case in 2016, or explaining the benefits of the fair trade system, as was the case in 2018. I'm going to go through some of the key points for each of these four questions in turn over the next four slides. In terms of the inequalities in world trade patterns, over 50% of world trade takes place between eight rich countries known as the G8. These countries and other more economically developed countries are more likely to import cheaper primary products, for example, mined ores, and use them to make manufactured goods like electronics, which they then sell, often for very large profits, to each other and back to less economically developed countries. These poorer, less economically developed countries, in turn, may often rely on only one or two primary products for most of their economic benefits, as is the case with the banana growing industry in Ecuador. However, the price of these primary products can often fluctuate. In particularly bad years, when crops fail and prices fall, less economically developed countries may sometimes need to increase the level of borrowing from other richer countries or from institutions like the World Bank. This results in these countries accumulating debts, and a large amount of their economy is then devoted to paying off these debts rather than to developing their own industries. More economically developed countries, meanwhile, can sometimes impose tariffs and quotas on imports from these poorer countries in order to protect their own industries, while political ideologies might lead some countries, as was the case with North Korea and Iran, to try and isolate themselves from the world trade system, or it can lead to other countries imposing sanctions on them from the outside. In terms of the impacts that these inequalities can then have on people and on the landscape, as I've said, these inequalities between richer and poorer parts of the world, like for example between the European Union and large parts of sub-Saharan Africa, can cause the gap in wealth to become ever wider. As I've already explained, less developed countries tend to have industries that are more focused on producing primary goods like tea and coffee, which they then generally export for relatively low prices. As a result, producers receive very low wages and can sometimes struggle to maintain what we would consider to be a decent standard of living. Manufactured goods that less economically developed countries might choose to import, for example, cars, are imported for much higher prices, often than what they've made as a result of exporting the primary goods. As a result, these countries find themselves in what they call a trade deficit, where they spend more money on imports from overseas than they make from exporting their own goods. This can lead to increased levels of debt, either with individual countries or with institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. More economically developed countries, meanwhile, sell expensive manufactured goods at relatively high and also relatively stable prices. This means that it is much easier to ensure a higher standard of living for their citizens, especially those who work in the related industries. As far as the impacts on the landscape are concerned, obviously primary production, especially industries like mining, can lead to serious environmental damages. Logging, for example, has caused large areas of deforestation in parts of the Amazon Basin and in the Congo Basin in West Africa. This has led to not just the loss of areas of rainforest, but also the destruction of animal habitats and the collapse of entire ecosystems. One of the ways in which countries sometimes try and reduce inequalities in world trade is by joining a trade alliance. The benefits of membership of trade alliances like the EU is that they allow free and equal trade between member states. 
consumers, in theory, have lower prices because businesses are able to exploit economies of scale, leading to cheaper goods, and also creating more opportunities for work across the European Union. Having a single currency, as is the case in the Eurozone, means that it's easier to compare prices, which stops prices in any one country becoming too expensive, making sure that prices remain low for consumers. Poorer areas in countries can sometimes receive grants from what are called EU structural funds, which help to improve the infrastructure and industry in the area. And free movement of people allows workers to go and seek employment in any other member state, not just the one that they were born in. The disadvantages of this, however, are that individual countries have to follow decisions and policies that are made at the level of the European Union and apply to all countries in the same way, as was the case with the common agricultural policy, despite the fact that these decisions might not necessarily be to everyone's benefit. Countries have to contribute a set amount of money each year to a central fund, with richer countries expected to contribute most, and poorer countries often ending up being net recipients of funds, that is, that they receive more money than they put in. High unemployment and low wages in new member states can sometimes lead to increased emigration. That is, states, when they join the European Union, see a lot of people of working age looking for better wages and higher standards of living in more established EU member countries. These countries that receive the migrants might then struggle to support them financially, whether it's providing more housing or schools or healthcare for their increased population. And this can sometimes lead to increased tension between immigrants and native populations over things like jobs and housing. Another way in which countries attempt to reduce the inequalities in world trade is by joining up to the fair trade scheme. The idea of the fair trade scheme is that more money goes directly to farmers, cutting out the middleman that is sometimes involved in the process of exporting primary goods to more developed countries. This means that farmers are paid fair wages for their work, as is the case, for example, with tea growers in Kenya. The Fair Trade Scheme also ensures safe working practices, preventing accidents and injuries, especially is the case when chemicals are being used in farms and on plantations. The Fair Trade Scheme encourages farmers to protect their environment by promoting organic farming so that these chemicals might not even be used in the first place. And because farmers receive a guaranteed minimum price for their goods, as is the case with cocoa in the Ivory Coast, they are less affected by some of those price fluctuations that I've already mentioned, which means that they have a reliable source of income even in bad years. This means that they are able to plan for future investments in advance without being forced to take on debts as a result of any shortfalls in their income. Money from fair trade banana schemes in Latin America can also be used to improve services in local communities like schools and health clinics. For example, healthcare services and education programs have been set up to try and help to reduce the spread of HIV AIDS in some of these fair trade scheme member states. That concludes the video for the trade and globalisation topic of the National 5 Geography course. Thank you for listening.